All right, so we've been drawing a lot of lines that represent bonds, um, and they represent covalent bonds. And so remember, covalent bonds represent sharing of electrons. And so let's take a little bit of a deeper look into this, right? So we have kind of a nucleus that's positively charged on one end, another nucleus that's positively charged on the other end, and then we have electrons in the middle, and they're both being pulled by the nuclei, right? The positive nuclei. So we can say that both nuclei pull the electrons in the bonds, right? If these electrons are in a bond between these, these two nuclei, they're both pulling on them. And so we can have different situations. In one situation, we can have that they're equally pulling on them, right? So that'd be like kind of like a hydrogen and a hydrogen situation. Hydrogen is the same element. And so they're going to pull on each other the same amount. And so we call this a pure covalent bond. On the exact opposite end of the spectra, we could have one of these nuclei pull much harder than the other one, so hard that it just rips this electron away from it, right? And so that's kind of like an ionic bond, right? It's with maybe sodium and chlorine, right? This chlorine turns into chloride and totally just rips off the electron from the sodium. So we have an ionic bond there. And then finally, in the third scenario, we can have something in the middle where one atom is pulling harder on the electrons, but not enough to pull them away from the electrons. And so this happens between the bond of oxygen and hydrogen. The oxygen pulls much harder than the hydrogen. And so even though they're sharing electrons, it's not equal sharing of the electron. The electron spends more time on the oxygen than it does on the hydrogen. And so this is called a polar covalent bond. So we can have these three different scenarios depending on how hard these atoms are pulling on the electrons. And so what determines how hard an atom pulls on the electrons is called electronegativity. Gets the symbol capital EN, electronegativity, and it's a measure of how much a nuclei pulls on electrons in a bond. Right. And think if we think about the trends on our periodic table, the first thing we have to recognize is that we ignore the noble gases because they generally don't form bonds. And then when we go from left to right, we have an increase in of electronegativity. And we go from bottom to top, we have an increase in electronegativity. So this top right corner is the most electronegative, with fluorine being the most electronegative atom, followed closely by oxygen being the second most electronegative atom. So here's our periodic table. In this case, what it's measuring is electronegativity, right? So the bigger this number, the bigger the electronegativity. And so we can see fluorine right here is number one with 3.98, followed then by oxygen and then chlorine. So generally, electronegativity decreases faster when you're going down versus left, right? So if they're both one away from fluorine, but this one's to the left, whereas chlorine is under, the oxygen is more electronegative, right? And that holds true. Nitrogen is more electronegative than bromine, even though they're both two spots away from fluorine, right? So you really want to know this trend, and it's not too difficult of a trend, right? The more top right the atom is, the more electronegative it is. So for example, we have HCl, right? HCl, this is a polar bond. And in this case, the chlorine is more electronegative than the hydrogen. And so we can represent this in multiple different ways. One is through the use of our delta sign or this partial. And so the hydrogen has less electrons because the chlorine is pulling on it harder. So the hydrogen is partially positive while the chlorine is partially negative. Another way we can represent this is through a dipole arrow, in which case we have an arrow with a plus sign on one end of it, right? And so the hydrogen end is more positive 
And then the arrowhead or the chlorine here is more negative, right? And we call this a dipole. So when a molecule has this polar bond, it can have a dipole. <clears throat> and so what is polar? What is nonpolar? There's a rough kind of guideline. So it depends on the difference in electronegativity between these three atoms. And so if this difference is less than 0.5, we say that it's pure covalent. If it's 0 0.5 to 2, we say it's uh, polar covalent. And then if it's greater than 2, we say that it's ionic. But this really is just a rough guideline. And in these kind of zones, is this ionic? Is this um, polar covalent? Is this pure covalent? Is this polar covalent? It really depends um, who you're talking to and kind of what the situation that you're talking about. For example, carbon and lithium, um, <clears throat> this has an electronegativity of 2.5, while lithium has electronegativity of one. And so the delta in this electronegativity is 1.5. And so it should be polar covalent. But if you think about it, carbon is a non-metal, lithium is a metal. So you're predicting um, actually an ionic interaction there. So depending on which textbook you look at, Either one are acceptable. You can draw this bond right here with this carbon or this lithium, or you can draw this negative here and, and then a positive lithium. Either of these are okay, but what you really need to understand here is that there's kind of a dipole here and that this carbon is uh, you know, more negatively charged than a carbon, say, connected to four hydrogens or something. Uh, just some kind of things to keep in mind. Carbon-carbon bonds are nonpolar. Carbon-hydrogen bonds are also considered nonpolar. Carbon-oxygen bonds are polar. Carbon-nitrogen bonds are also polar. Carbon-halogen bonds, so chlorine, fluorine, bromine, are also polar. And then anything basically oxygen, nitrogen, or a halogen, bonded to hydrogen, all of these are also polar, right? And so this pooling of electrons is also called an inductive effect. And we'll touch on that uh, later on when we start learning about acids and bases and start looking more at the properties of these molecules. But for now, you need to be able to identify whether a bond is going to be polar or nonpolar. Um, and for 99% of cases, you can just use these guidelines right here.